Hi, everyone, and welcome to this lecture on Chapter 11. Um, again, I'm probably going to do a two-part uh, lecture here, so please make sure to log back on and watch the second part for Chapter 11. So continuing our conversation about micronutrients, um, and in Chapter 11, we focus specifically on micronutrients that support bone health. So we'll start this lecture off with just a really quick and basic overview of our bones and a little bit about how they are actually very metabolically active. Um, I think we often think about bones as sort of these like, um, almost like rock-like structures that don't change or do anything, but actually they're continually changing <clears throat> every day um, based on our other body nutrient um, stores and based on our dietary intake. So our bones are very, are very active. I think we often recognize that our bones are very active during like infancy, childhood, and adolescence as our bones are forming and bone density is being established. But even through adulthood and our later years of life, that bone is actually active tissue and it's continually changing. It's continu continually sort of breaking down and being rebuilt. So just like any other tissue in our bone, sorry, just like any other tissue in our body, um, bone is tissue and it is active. So we, you know, your textbook says that it is a live living organ. Um, <clears throat> bones are also supported by cartilage and connective tissue. So um, like, again, in anatomy and physiology, or if you're going on to study the body, whether through nursing or like exercise physiology or even nutrition, you'll learn that there's um, continual relationship between bone, cartilage, and connective tissue. Um, of course, your bones have nerve and um, nerves and blood vessels that run through the bone, and that's how they are, I guess that's how they can be active. That's how they can receive new nutrients, and that's how they can actually supply the body with some of the nutrients that are stored in the bone. Um, so overall, to support the body, bones obviously provide some strength and some flexibility to allow us to, you know, stand upright <laughs> and to move. So bones are, as, as you probably know, um, contain a lot of different minerals, contain a lot of minerals, and we'll learn about some of the different ones that are stored in the bone. About 65% of the mass of our bones is made up of minerals, and it is the minerals, just like in rock, it is the minerals that provide that hardness or that firmness that allow bones to be so strong. And then the other 35% of bone is made up of organic substances, organic structures, and it's these structures that provide the durability and specifically the flexibility of the bone. Um, so you'll, again, if you have studied ANP, you'll know that part of that flexibility is due to collagen. And so when we talk about, hmm, I should have put this up top, when we talk about this mineral um, collection in the bones, <clears throat> well, I guess, it, I guess it does relate to both, but hydroxyapatite are these sort of like um, crystalline structures made up of minerals and actually they are made up around a collagen um, sort of base. So it's this, it's this mixture of collagen and minerals that really allow the bone to be so strong and yet flexible. Um, so we call these mineral and uh, these crystalline mineral structures hydroxyapatite crystals. Um, so this is kind of a nice chart that just sort of summarizes the way that bone supports structure um, and support to the body, and then the way that bone supports metabolic processes in the body. So we'll look at structure and support first. So again, of course, bones provide that physical, like kind of like scaffolding of the body, right? They provide that scaffolding structure on which the rest of our body really exists. So, so they bones 
that allow us to support other organs and other body segments. Um, bones also protect our vital organs. I think the most obvious example of that is our skull, right, protecting the brain, and then of course the rib cage, which protects the lungs. Uh, and then uh, maybe arguably <laughs> one of the most important is um, the vertebra, like the vertebral column in each of those individual vertebrae. Um, the spinal cord actually runs uh, through those vertebrae, so they in a way that in that way then are protecting the spinal cord and the vertebra are bones. Um, and then bones work with our muscles, right? Maybe you're familiar with tendons. Tendons are the way that muscles attach the bone. And so this allows for movement because the muscle can, when muscles contract, because they're attached to the bone, they move the bone based on their contraction. And so that, um, that muscular contraction moving the bone then allows the body to move in, in various ways. And then you know, from a metabolic perspective, um, bones support our bodies uh, because bones are sort of a storage site or a storage reservoir, you could say, for lots of different minerals. Um, the most obvious, I think, to people, because it's sort of been drilled into our heads, um, is calcium. Uh, but bones also store phosphorus. They also store magnesium, actually. That's not written here, but we're going to talk about magnesium in this lecture. And bones also store fluoride. And then even small amounts of vitamin K can be found stored in the bone. Um, so depending on body needs, and again, depending on dietary intake, um, the, we can actually pull these minerals out of the bone if, if and when they need to be used by other processes or other parts of the body. Um, and then another way that bones support metabolic function in the body is that most of our uh, red blood cells are produ produced in red bone marrow. So bones are, again, very, very active organ, very active tissue. Um, supporting the body in myriad different ways. Okay, so a little more about the structure of bone. Um, there are two types of bone that we learn about in this class. There's cortical bone, which is like a really dense, compact uh, type of bone. And about 80% of the bones in our body are cortical or compact bone. Um, specifically, we'll find cortical bone around the outer surfaces of the bone. Uh, so again, kind of like protective to that hydroxyapatite um, structure that we'll find more towards the center of the bone. <clears throat> and so that center part of the bone is what we call trabecular bone or spongy bone. And so this makes up about 80% of like the bone mass in our bodies. So this is the inside of the bone. Again, this term scaffolding could be used to describe what trabecular bone looks like. So it is sort of this, if you're familiar with scaffolding, like what might be used to paint a house or even build a house or any other building. Um, uh, scaffolding is like this complex structure um, that allows, uh, well, <laughs> I guess you could then build something around a scaffolding if you wanted to. So it's a really um, supporting structure. So you could say that trabecular bone supports that outer cortical bone. Um, and it is the trabecular bone where we see most of the what we call bone turnover. And turnover is, is literally just the breaking down of the bone and then the regeneration of new bone material. Um, so when we need to pull out calcium or if we need to pull out phosphorus or fluoride or magnesium, um, it's more the trabecular bone that will get turned over to release some of those minerals. And so therefore we say that trabecular bone is more sensitive to hormonal changes, like specifically hormonal changes that happen in females after menopause. And then of course, um, sensitive to nutritional deficiencies, again, like dietary nutritional deficiencies, where the person isn't eating enough of these minerals, again, calcium, magnesium, vitamin K, and so the body needs to actually dip into its own storage of these nutrients um, to, to provide them to the body for other uses. 
here's just an, a visual image of your, the structure of your bone. So again, you can see around the outside is that compact or cortical bone. And then in the center, you can see it does kind of have a spongy look. That's the trabecular bone. Um, again, the part that we call kind of scaffolding. And so it's this part of the bone that supports the outer uh, cortical bit. And so we'll also learn a little bit about, um, about these processes of bone turnover uh, and, and bone growth and modeling, which happen um, during childhood and adolescence. So during childhood and adolescence, we have what are called bone growth and bone modeling. Oh, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I caught a lot of these girls and boys and men and women, but, uh, and changed them to male, female. So forgive me, I missed these, I missed this slide. Um, so bone growth is what we see, <clears throat> um, again, during infancy, during childhood and adolescence. And this is just literally an increase in bone size. So bone growth is technically done or complete by the time females reach about age 18 and by the time males reach about age 21. So by early 20s, our bones no longer grow in size. And as you might know, bo bone size is part of what contributes to height. So this is why we say typically by the late teens, females have reached their maximum height. And by the early 20s, males have reached their maximum height. And then bone modeling is the, is the type of bone development that gives shape to the bones. So again, this is shaping the various bones in our body. Like if you think about the bones in your forearm, right, they have a very different shape than say your skull bone. Um, and even if you think about, you know, um, your humerus, which is your upper arm bone that comes down and, and helps create your elbow, like that has a very different shape than say your scapula, like that long, that big flat bone on the back of your shoulder. So that's what modeling is. And, and then even think about the bones in your fingers and your feet, the bones in your toes and your ankle, right? all very different shapes. And think about your hip bones, right? super different shapes um, of all these different bones. So the modeling or the shaping of bone um, is also complete by about the mid 20s. Um, and then um, some lifestyle factors, well, lots of lifestyle factors actually affect bone growth and bone modeling. Um, exercise can have a, a pretty strong impact on bone density, as we'll talk about. Um, and over being overweight can also influence that too, because the more weight a person is carrying around, uh, the more like stress they're going to put on their bones. And then we have this process called bone remodeling. Um, and bone remodeling is something that happens throughout our lifetime. So this is a process that involves both the breakdown of old tissue and the formation of new bone tissue. And so again, when we say back here that trabecular bone is um, subject to faster, higher rates of turnover, we're specifically meaning higher rates of bone remodeling. So when, um, when there are nutritional deficiencies and when hormonal changes do occur, we're going to see higher rates of bone remodeling because we need to release more of those micronutrients that are stored in the bone to provide the body with those nutrients because they're not coming from the diet anymore. Um, we also see higher rates of bone remodeling with good um, weight-bearing exercises that put stress on the bone and cause the bone to um, kind of break down old bone tissue and build new tissue. We do see bone remodeling also during um, periods of growth and modeling, but just pointing out this is something that continues into adulthood, whereas growth and modeling, or the shaping of the bone, finishes by early adulthood. They both finish by early adulthood. Um, <clears throat> So figure 11.2 in your book, you can see again, bone growth and bone modeling, they both begin in the womb and they both end in early adulthood. Whereas bone remodeling um, can occur during that childhood and adolescent time, but it does occur primarily during adulthood. Um, it involves two processes, 
the breakdown of old bone tissue, which we call uh, bone resorption, and the formation of new bone tissue, which we call bone formation. Um, so bone remodeling supports the maintenance of bone integrity. So it's not, again, it's both resorption and formation. So it's not just breaking down the bone to release the minerals, but it is also forming new bone, um, again, with proper exercise and proper diet to help maintain whatever bone density was developed during childhood and adolescence during childhood and adolescence. Um, so it replaces old bone with new bone, again, to maintain a mineral balance, to maintain min mineral balance in the bone as well as throughout the body. So I just mentioned this concept of bone density um, and peak bone density. So um, bone density is referring just to the, the denseness of the bone or the compactness of the bone, which is basically to say, you know, how much of that hydroxyapatite structure has formed and how much mineral density is in those bones. So um, in our lifetime, we actually achieve the highest bone density that we will ever achieve pretty early in life. So females typically achieve their highest bone density, which is what we call peak bone density, at about 17 years of age and males achieve peak bone density at about 20 years of age, um, early 20s. So peak bone density is also gonna be the time in the, in the life cycle when bones are their strongest. So when they have that, that greatest amount of mass per volume, <laughs> that greatest amount of mass in the bones. So peak bone density occurs um, pretty early in life. And then the objective would be to try to maintain as much of that peak bone density as possible um, throughout the rest of adulthood. So <clears throat> um, some of the things that can contribute to peak bone density are shown here on the bottom. These are all specifically written in a way that indicate um, lower peak bone density. So you could just think about the opposite uh, to, to figure out how to achieve higher peak bone density. Um, so again, sorry, I missed uh, the edits here, but um, late onset for puberty in both males and females is going to attribute, is going to lead to a lower peak bone density. Um, of course, inadequate calcium intake is going to contribute to lower peak bone density. And the opposite would be adequate calcium intake would support highest peak bone density. Um, again, having a low body weight during childhood and adolescence would also lead to a lower peak bone density because there's less mass on the body to stress the bones. And it's, it's, that, it's that good amount of stress from physical activity and having a healthy body weight that are going to cause more of that bone growth, um, specifically bone growth, to support um, bone density. And then also physical inactivity during those, you know, early adolescent and teen years. Um, physical inactivity is also going to contribute to lower peak bone density. And again, by the, the opposite um, take, having adequate physical activity would support good, healthy peak bone density. Um, so back to bone remodeling. So this is what's going on during, predominantly during the adult years. So I mentioned these two, um, we've said it a couple of times now, bone remodeling involves two processes, bone resorption and bone formation. So bone resorption is, it's a resorption of the minerals. So, um, so in order to allow those minerals to be available to the body, we actually have to break some of the bone down. So the surface of the bones are broken down um, to release minerals. Or again, if it's um, due to healthy physical activity and weight bearing exercises, then bones are going to be broken down to erode um, old, to get rid of old bone cells so that new bone cells can form and thereby make the bone stronger. So bone resorption happens um, by these cells that are called osteoclasts. 
So these are cells that erode the surface of the bone. So osteoclasts do this process of bone resorption. And then um, we have different types of cells called osteoblasts, which do this process of bone formation. And you can, um, again, one of the ways I try to remember this is that osteoblasts build new bone cells. So again, you can think of the B in osteoblast and the B in the word build. And then osteoclasts uh, kind of takes me back to that <laughs> thought about anabolism and catabolism. And I use the example of cats being kind of destructive. So I <laughs> remember catabolism is breaking down larger molecules. Um, so in a similar way, osteoclast, if you want to continue with that C concept and the, the cat, osteoclasts break down old bone. I know that also uses the letter B, but um, anyway, <laughs> whatever you need to do to remember osteoclast versus osteoblast. Um, so osteoblasts uh, synthesize new bone, um, again, by building more collagen and hydroxyapatite crystals. Um, so bone resorption breaks down bone cells, bone formation builds new bones, builds new collagen, builds new hydroxyapatite crystals. Um, so in young, healthy adults, bone resorption and formation are going to be equal to each other. Um, and then as life progresses, as we get older, um, bone resorption actually starts to slow down, uh, sorry, bone resorption actually starts to speed up um, and bone formation may slow down. So what that means is that after age 40, bone density really begins to decrease. So in our 20s and 30s, we can maintain, we can try to maintain that peak bone density. And after our 40s, we may not be able to really maintain peak bone density any longer, but we can certainly still um, lead very healthy lifestyles so as to slow the rate of um, bone density decline. So high peak bone mass can be achieved through proper nutrition and exercise. This is just going to support having a stronger skeleton um, and it's certainly going to be protective against osteoporosis. Um, and this is figure 11.3 in your book, just showing um, bone resorption and bone formation and showing the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts. Um, actually, I don't really think an osteoblast is being shown here, but um, you can see these are osteoclasts breaking down the bone surface and these are osteo, well, somewhere there is an osteoblast helping to build these new bones, right? I think they're trying to indicate that these are osteoblasts, but those also kind of look like new um, osteocytes, new bone cells to me. So maybe not the best picture, but, um, and again, this is also reminding us that bone remodeling is occurring primarily in your trabecular or spongy bone. Um, okay, so how do we assess bone health? So the, the primary way that bone health is assessed is through something called a DEXA scan, um, which stands for Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry. And so this is a pretty nice, pretty non-invasive test that can be done. Um, and basically the results from your test would be compared to the average peak bone density of a healthy 30-year-old adult. So someone who should have still relatively high um, or pretty close to peak bone density um, because they're only a few years out from having achieved peak bone density. So um, the test is, um, the test results are written in what is called a T-score. So your T-score is compared to the average healthy 30-year-old T-score. Um, and then your results can be used to diagnose osteoporosis, um, risk for fracture, or again, to indicate healthy bone density. So healthy bone density is considered um, having a T-score of minus one to positive one. Um, and then the more negative the number gets, the greater the risk for, the greater the, <laughs> the greater the indication of um, 
decreased bone density. So what we consider low bone density or low bone mass would be a T-score of minus one, minus two and a half. And then um, osteoporosis can be diagnosed when the T-score is more negative than 2.5. Again, after our early 20s, we, we can't really increase bone mass or bone density anymore, but we can save whatever bone density we have. And then after our 40s, or in our 40s, um, we're most likely going to be seeing some decline in bone mass, but we can slow the rate of decline, again, by through proper nutrition and proper physical activity. Um, so good for anybody to get a DEXA scan, especially, you know, in their late 30s, early 40s, to start to have a sense for what your, you know, what your bone health is. This can also obviously be done with younger, younger people too, with adolescents, um, depending on their physical activity level and nutrition status, it might be necessary to see what their bone health looks like at that age. Um, DEXA scans are awfully, often highly recommended for postmenopausal women because as we see, as we will see, um, after menopause, estrogen levels in the body start to decline, and that is associated with um, again, increased bone resorption or lower bone density. Uh, so there's the DEXA scan. Uh, this little machine will move across the body um, and basically assess the bone mineral density uh, and then read it out as a T-score. Okay, so that's kind of our intro to bone health. Um, and then we're gonna spend the rest of the chapter talking about these um, six. We're gonna talk about two vitamins and four minerals that support bone health. And then we'll end the chapter as always with a little review of um, different diseases or disorders that are associated with bone health. So we'll start with calcium, perhaps the most well-known um, micronutrient uh, associated with bone health. So calcium is certainly important, uh, certainly an important component of those hydroxyapatite structures. Um, we do also see some calcium in our teeth as well. So about 99% of all of the calcium stored in the body is um, stored in the bone, and then some of it is, also, that last 1% would also be found in the teeth. Um, so calcium is important for that, the structure of our bones, and that's why it's there, but calcium also has a lot of other jobs in the body. So one of the things calcium can do is support that acid-base balance of the body, um, calcium has a more alkaline, is a more alkaline um, mineral or substance, so it can help um, if the if blood pH becomes too acidic. Calcium can help to balance that out. Um, calcium also supports nerve impulse transmission and muscle contraction. We talked about both of those in the electrolyte lecture. Calcium then, of course, also supports blood pressure, healthy blood pressure. It, can initiate blood clotting, and it can also help regulate some of our hormones and enzymes. Um, so probably these are the big three that we've talked about in our class. Um, and then of course, because calcium is so critical, we have, um, we have different mechanisms of maintaining blood calcium levels. So again, we're gonna need calcium for any of these various um, metabolic functions throughout the day, throughout our lifetime. And so we're going to, um, the body kind of regulates how much calcium is in the blood at any given time, very similar to glucose, blood glucose regulation. And so depending on our dietary intake, um, so which would influence our body status of calcium, we may or may not need to dip into the bones to release some calcium into the blood to raise blood calcium levels back up to normal. So um, let's take a look at what happens when blood calcium levels are low. How does the body respond to this? So we have a, um, a central... Um, part of the body, the parathyroid gland, is going to be really critical in helping to 
regulate blood calcium levels. So the parathyroid gland is going to be is going to be the organ that's notified and and helps to um, I don't have my words. <laughs> um, the parathyroid gland is the one that's going to notice when blood calcium levels are too high or too low. So when blood calcium levels are too low, um, parathyroid gland is going to receive this information and respond by secreting a hormone called parathyroid hormone. So um, Parathyroid hormone has a couple of specific actions. Parathyroid hormone is going to increase the activation of vitamin D. We'll talk about this more um, when, we, when we get through the different minerals, oh, sorry, when we get through the different micronutrients um, involved in um, bone regulation and uh, yeah. <laughs> so, we're, so parathyroid hormone will increase the activation of vitamin D. That's one of its jobs. Its other job is um, to act itself directly on the bone and the kidneys to release calcium. So the parathyroid hormone is going to say, hey, bones, you've got calcium in there. Osteoclasts, go ahead and break down some of those bone cells and release some of that calcium into the blood. And in the same way, kidneys you know, absorb, reabsorb more calcium um, out of that filtrate and put it back in the blood. Vitamin D also acts in, acts very similarly. So vitamin D is gonna have the same action as parathyroid hormone on the bones. It's going to increase the release of calcium into the bloodstream, again, due to that increased bone breakdown. Vitamin D is going to have increased reabsorption of calcium by the kidneys, putting that calcium into the blood. And then vitamin D has a third role separate from or in addition to the, the same things that parathyroid hormone does, which is to actually act on the intestines and tell the intestines to increase their absorption of calcium. So this is kind of interesting. What this is indicating, and, and we have seen this already before with some of our other micronutrients, what this is indicating is that we don't always have just a continual um, rate of absorption of different micronutrients. We absorb more micronutrients when we need more, and we absorb less when we need less. We also absorb less, as we'll see, if there's more of a micronutrient in our food, that's actually going to, that may decrease our absorption of that micronutrient. Um, so all these three actions are going to result in blood calcium levels rising. Um, yeah. Okay, then we can look at the opposite. So in the opposite direction, <clears throat> when blood calcium levels are high, so this would be like after a meal that contained a good amount of calcium, the, your intestines absorb that calcium uh, from the food and now it's in the blood. So what is the body gonna do with it? So again, parathyroid gland is going to sense this and parathyroid gland is going to decrease its synthesis of parathyroid hormone. So that means then the synthesis and activation of vitamin D is also going to be suppressed or decreased. So then these three actions that we saw are all going to be reversed. So the kidneys, vitamin D is no longer acting on the kidneys, so they're going to decrease their reabsorption of calcium and increase their excretion of excess calcium. Um, vitamin D is no longer going to act on the intestines, so they're going to decrease their absorption of calcium. And vitamin D is no longer going to act on the bones, so there's going to be decreased bone resorption. So all that is going to lead to decreased blood calcium levels. Okay, so here is a little overview of some of the things that I've already said. Um, so calcium absorption, how do we get it from our intestines into the blood? So majority of calcium is actually absorbed from the duodenum, that first part of the small intestine. Um, as I sort of alluded to, we, we generally only absorb so much of these different micronutrients at any given meal. So it's been suggested that we might only absorb about 500 milligrams of calcium per meal. So um, kind of an important takeaway from that statement is that we should space out 
our intake of calcium rich foods throughout the day. So rather than just like downing two glasses of milk and thinking that that's going to be your calcium for the day, actually better to space out your intake of various types of calcium rich foods. So we'll see that some of our dark green vegetables are good sources of calcium. Tofu can be a good source of calcium. So have some calcium rich food at each meal throughout the day. And in that way, you can kind of ensure that you're going to get enough dietary calcium throughout the day. Um, also, it seems that con uh, consuming calcium with um, potentially slightly acidic foods can help increase or enhance the absorption of calcium. Also, having adequate vitamin D levels will enhance the absorption of calcium. This is a pretty important one. Um, so this is um, not necessarily that you need to have vitamin D in the meal with the calcium, um, but that you need to have adequate body levels of, uh, vi of vitamin D. And then, so this concept of bioavailability, I've basically been talking about it without saying this name. This is actually, especially if you go on to study nutrition, this is a really critical concept. <laughs> Um, or even if you go on in nursing, bioavailability is really, or medicine or anything else, um, bioavailability is an important concept. So bioavailability refers to the body's ability to absorb and utilize any micronutrient at any given time. So right here, we're talking about the bioavailability of calcium, but this term, we can use this term to talk about all of the micronutrients we've, we've learned about and will learn about in this class. So bioavailability of any micronutrient depends on age, depends on the current body status of that nutrient, and depending on the micronutrient may depend on the body status of other nutrients as well. Like as I've said, the, um, our ability to absorb and utilize calcium depends on the body status of vitamin D, and it also depends on how much calcium we have already in the bodies or in our body. Um, the bioavailability, so the amount that we're going to absorb from the food, def depends on how much calcium is in the meal that we're eating. And then bioavailability can also be affected by other factors in the food. So actually, the acidic, the acidity of the, um, by environment up here, I mean like the acidity of the, you know, the inside of the duodenum at the time of absorption. Um, so that actually affects then the bioavailability of calcium. Um, and then we're also going to learn about in this chapter things called phytates and oxalates. And these are some compounds that we find in plant foods that typically are bound to lots of different minerals. And so um, technically phytates and oxalates, um, we don't digest these very well. So typically whatever minerals they're bound to, we don't absorb those minerals. Um, so we could say that phytates and oxalates decrease the bioavailability of some of these micronutrients. Uh, but what we've seen is that there's usually enough of the micronutrient present that the phytates and oxalates don't have a very significant impact on our absorption of these micronutrients. Furthermore, phytates and oxalates can break down by cooking, by heat, so um, any, again, this would be primarily plant foods. So any plant foods that contain phytates and oxalates, simply steaming them or stir frying them is gonna break down the phytates and oxalates enough so that whatever they might be bound to, you're going to be able to absorb them. Um, but again, worth knowing about because <laughs> some people have made quite a stink about phytates and oxalates in the popular media in recent years. Okay, so what are the recommendations? Um, so there is an RDA for calcium for males and females. Um, basically adult years would be a thousand milligrams per day. As we age though, um, as we saw bone um, resorption is gonna increase relative to formation. Um, and also our, um, our ability to absorb, so actually right here, age, or the bioavailability of calcium is going to decrease with age. We're going to absorb less as we age because all systems start to break down as we age, including our digestive and absorption um, processes. So 
Um, it is recommended to increase calcium intake as we age. Um, and then when we're young, so when bones are being formed, um, this is actually when calcium recommendation is highest, so 1,300 mg per day during those critical bone growth and bone formation years. And then there is a suggested tolerable upper intake level, which is 25 mg per day. So what are some of the food sources of calcium? Again, I think the dairy industry has done a good job of letting it be known that um, cow's milk can be a source of calcium, um, but there are lots of other vegetables that don't have huge PR teams behind them um, <laughs> that are also good sources of calcium. So most of our green vegetables, and especially green leafy vegetables, are good sources of calcium. So kale, collard greens, broccoli, cabbage, these are uh, bok choy also, these are all gonna contain calcium. Um, fish, especially fish whose bones you might eat, like sardines, like, like a lot of the smaller fish, so sardines and even potentially salmon, um, you're gonna get calcium from their, eating their bones um, or making like a bone broth and then, uh, or like a, you know, a fish broth or a fish sauce by stewing their bones. And then many foods are fortified with calcium also. So um, some tofu and soy products might be fortified with calcium. Um, I don't recommend getting your calcium from orange juice, but I guess you can if you're gonna get a fortified orange juice. Um, so again, um, this chart from your book, figure 11.6, just showing some of those food sources relative to the RDA. So the RDA, again, for adults is 1,000 megs. Um, and you can see, again, like collard greens um, and tofu, like if you were to have you know, a nice like stir fry with collard greens and tofu, you're probably going to get you know, just shy of half of your calcium need for that um, meal. Remember, also, we don't really absorb much more than 500 megs of calcium at a given meal. So important to space out your calcium intake and include calcium rich foods at every meal. Okay, so what happens if we have too much calcium? Again, um, the body is very efficient. So if we've, eat, if we've eaten too much calcium, if we've managed to do that, we will actually just excrete the extra in our feces. Um, the real, as, as with any of the other micronutrients we've talked about, before or so far, the real risk, um, the real issue comes from over supplementation. So excess dietary calcium, sorry, I should say excess supplemental calcium can result in a condition called hypercalcemia. And again, as we've been doing, just check out those words, hyper meaning high or too much, and calcemia referring to calcium. Um, make sure to kind of check yourself with hyperkalemia with a K, that's high blood potassium, right? Um, so this is hypercalcemia for calcium. Um, so uh, this is typically caused by over supplementation, but it can also be caused by cancer or overproduction of parathyroid hormone. So symptoms of hypercalcemia include um, fatigue, loss of appetite, constipation, mental confusion. These are all brought about by basically electrolyte imbalance. Um, and then what we can also see from too much um, calcium intake, calcium deposits in our soft tissues. So typically that would be kidney, liver, and heart. Um, I have heard of calcium deposits also sort of like calcium spurs on bones. Um, and then calcium deposition in the kidney obviously could lead to kidney stones. Um, interesting point here with over supplementation. A lot of foods are fortified with calcium or fortified with various micronutrients. There is some, um, I guess, debate over whether or not to call fortified foods technically supplements, because fortification is adding these nutrients in where they don't exist naturally. Um, so consider that too, because it's, it's also not um, impossible to technically over supplement with calcium by consuming too many calcium fortified foods. So just check that nutrition facts panel 
check to see how much calcium is in per serving, and remember to try to space out your calcium intake across all the meals of the day. What happens if we don't have enough calcium, so calcium deficiency? I mean, the biggest risk, risk would be osteoporosis, right? I mean, osteo meaning bone, porosis meaning porous. So osteoporosis is having porous bones or basically losing that, um, losing that important structure, um, losing that bone density is, is basically osteoporosis. So then having really weak and brittle bones and increasing your risk for fracture um, and also losing the function of bones. So losing that bone structure, losing that um, like skeletal support. So that's the biggest risk for calcium deficiency is leading to osteoporosis. Um, prior to getting to osteoporosis, we would, we would call low blood calcium hypocalcemia. Um, and this can be caused by certainly not eating enough calcium, um, but it could also be caused by kidney disease where perhaps the kidneys don't reabsorb enough calcium. Um, definitely can be caused by not enough vitamin D, so it can be caused by vitamin D deficiency. And then it could also be caused by any sort of disease that affects parathyroid hormone, resulting in reduced production of parathyroid hormone. Um, and so symptoms of hypocalcemia would be muscle spasms and convulsions. Um, again, this would be prior to getting to the state of osteoporosis, like early stage hypocalcemia. Okay, and then the next nutrient we'll talk about is vitamin D. Vitamin D is one of our four fat-soluble vitamins. Remember, D, E, A, and K are the fat-soluble ones. Looks like an H. <laughs> Um, so vitamin D can be stored in the liver and stored in our adipose tissue. Um, the most important thing to know about vitamin D is that it is a nutrient, it is a vitamin that we make ourselves. So we make vitamin D in our skin, well, and with the help of the liver, upon exposure to the UV rays from the sun. Um, vitamin D is often called a hormone. That's a fun, that's a, that's a, <laughs> question that um, likes to be asked on tests. So vitamin D also acts, basically acts like a hormone, meaning we make it in one location of the body and it regulates activities in other parts of the body. That's sort of the basic definition of a hormone. Um, so vitamin D helps to regulate blood calcium levels in conjunction with parathyroid hormone, as we saw. And remember vitamin D acts on the bones, acts on the intestines, and acts on the kidneys. Um, so that's, that is a, the prime, a prime example of how vitamin D acts as a hormone, because we make it in the skin and the liver, but then it has action on the, it regulates action and activity in the bones, the kidneys, and the intestines. Um, so again, vitamin D can stimulate the osteoclast to act when blood calcium is low or when calcium is needed elsewhere in the body. Um, interestingly though, we also need vitamin D for bone calcification. So vitamin D is very interesting because it, it both regulates, it, it, it regulates osteoclast activity, but it is also critical for actually getting calcium into the bones for calcium deposition in the bones. So it sort of does both things. Um, uh, adequate vitamin D intake may also be associated with decreased cancer growth. So it could be a potential cancer treatment or part of cancer treatment. Um, and vitamin D is also involved in cell differentiation. So many different functions of vitamin D, many different functions, um, in particular like cell differentiation, cell differentiation tends to go along with your immune system. So vitamin D is often considered a really important nutrient to take during cold and flu season, or if you are sick and trying to recover, um, vitamin D supplementation is often suggested. So here's a quick little overview of how we make vitamin D from sunlight. So in the skin, you might remember I said in the lipid lecture that we make vitamin D from um, sterols, from cholesterol, which is a type of sterol. So in the skin, we have this lipid compound called 7-dehydrocholesterol, right? So 
So that, that compound exists in the skin. Um, and when that compound reacts with UV rays from the sun, it gets converted into something called cholecalciferol. Um, and cholecalciferol is what we call vitamin D3. Vitamin D3, so it's the form of vitamin D that we make in our bodies. Um, and then the liver will convert vitamin D3 to something called calcidiol, and then the kidneys will convert calcidiol to something called calcitriol, which is the active form of this compound. Um, so you can see just some slight variations, right? Some additional um, alcohol groups added to this to make it an active vitamin or an active compound. So maybe worth familiarizing yourself with this name, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3. So this is the active form of vitamin D, also known as calcitriol. Um, yep. And then the precursor is cholecalciferol. So cholecalciferol is also called vitamin D3, but it's basically the inactive form of 125-dihydroxy-D3. Um, okay, so vitamin D adequacy, in order to have enough, in order to have adequate amounts of vitamin D in the body, um, and just a side note, adequacy might take you back to unit one when we talked about the uh, four or five key components of a healthful diet. You might remember that adequacy was one of them, getting adequate amounts of these different nutrients into your body. So in order to have adequate vitamin D status in the body, we need to have adequate sunlight exposure. So assuming all of us are in you know, New York or potentially Pennsylvania, um, <laughs> we are in a part of the world where we don't get enough sun exposure year round. So for latitudes above 40 degrees north and latitudes below 40 degrees south, the angle of the sun and the amount of, of sunlight during the day is too little during winter months to actually produce vitamin D. So inadequate sunlight in the winter in high you know, far northern latitudes and far south latitudes. Um, other things that are going to affect vitamin D status and vitamin D synthesis is skin pigmentation. So uh, melanin is a compound in our skin that's actually protective against excessive UV radiation. And so you might notice folks who, are, who originate or whose ancestors originate from um, parts of the world close, closest to the equator have a darker skin color relative to people who originate from or whose ancestors originate from actually farther north latitudes. And so that actually has everything to do with the amount of sunlight exposure close to the equator relative to the amount of sun exposure farther from the equator. So the melanin pigmentation is protective, as I said, against, against like excessive full day direct sunlight. Uh, so basically, melanin blocks UV penetration to the skin. Well, what that means, now that we have this totally globalized world and people live in parts of the world where their ancestors maybe didn't, didn't originate, um, we now have people with darker skin living in high north latitudes and living in far south latitudes. And so the risk there is that now they have both high levels of melanin in the skin, which blocks UV absorption, and suddenly in an environment where there isn't enough sun exposure all year long. So people living in high um, north or far south latitudes with darker skin are at a higher risk for vitamin D deficiency. Um, and then also age. So as we age, we have a decreased ability to synthesize vitamin D uh, from the UV rays. And then also we're learning that obesity seems to decrease vitamin D synthesis as well. So many things that affect vitamin D status in the body. Here's a fun little picture looking at 
um, 37 degrees north latitude. So you can see here we are <laughs> way up here in New York and even all of the state of Pennsylvania is north of 37 degrees. I said 40 degrees north latitude over here. Um, I suppose it depends on what you read, but basically northern latitudes. So anywhere north of 37 or north of 40 degrees latitude, um, north latitude, you're going to have decreased sunlight exposure. So throughout throughout the winter months. So the point in saying that is that supplementation might be um, worth uh, worthwhile. So here is also a really helpful table. Lots of exam questions would come from this. Um, factors that enhance vitamin D synthesis and factors that inhibit vitamin D synthesis. Um, let's go through the inhibit first because we've kind of just rattled off a bunch of these. So again, winter months, uh, basically October through February, there's practically no vitamin D production. Again, far north latitudes and far south latitudes don't get enough sunlight during the winter months. Um, well, you don't also get seasons <laughs> if you're not at these high latitudes. Time of day is critical too. So early morning, late afternoon and evening hours, the sun is not high enough. Um, in the sky, and so the UV rays are not strong enough to penetrate the skin. Again, as we age, we have a reduced um, ability to synthesize uh, vitamin D. Sunscreen also blocks UV radiation, so excessive sunscreen use is going to decrease vitamin D production. Clouds block the UV rays. Um, there are now clothes that can block UV rays. Actually, most clothes will block most UV rays. Again, melanin in the skin blocks UV radiation, and also glass and plastics. So like windows made of glass or plexiglass also block the sun's rays. So you can't just sit inside and sunbathe on the couch. You actually need to go outside and get direct UV radiation on your skin. Not for very long, actually it's just recommended like 15 to 20 minutes, but in that midday sun. And then again, obesity um, is potentially decreasing our ability to make and store vitamin D. So then on the left side, basically all the opposites. So things that enhance vitamin D synthesis. So again, summer months, particularly June and July, when that sun is highest and strongest. Um, again, locations closer to the equator are going to get more sunlight, more direct sunlight year round. Again, time of day I think is critical. So generally it's suggested between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., at least at our latitude. So up here in Pennsylvania or New York, um, that's where you're gonna get the, that's the time of day when you're gonna get the strongest UV radiation. So that's what I mean, spend at least 15 to 20 minutes outside daily between 10 and three. So that's like an after lunch walk but you do need to make sure your skin is exposed. So if it's June or July, you're probably wearing shirts and shorts and a t-shirt anyway, um, but you know, it's March right now. So, um, <laughs> so um, wear, if you can, you know, roll your sleeves up if it's warm enough, um, potentially wear, you know, cropped pants or if it is warm enough, wear some shorts. And so get that sunlight exposure on your legs and on your arms. It is, in my opinion, it's actually smart to put sunscreen on your face because that skin is really thin and you're probably not doing a whole lot of vitamin D synthesis on your face. It's more that thicker skin on those, um, like the, the, the parts of your body that are more exposed to the elements anyway. So again, your arms and your legs and potentially even your um, midsection, like when you, if you wear a bathing suit, but that, you know, or your back and shoulders, but also those parts of the body don't get sunlight exposure very often for half the year. So the best places are your, just your arms and your legs. So expose those to the sunlight for 15 to 20 minutes a day, um, particularly like March through October. Um, and then again, as when we're younger, we make more vitamin D relative to when we're older. Um, again, not using sunscreen on your arms and legs for at least those 15 to 20 minutes is going to allow you to make enough vitamin D. Of course, the sun is necessary. 
um, exposing your skin, so not wearing, you know, as I'm saying, not, you know, not covering up your arms and legs, at least for those 15 to 20 minutes. And then again, lighter skin pigmentation, meaning lack of melanin or less melanin in the skin is going to allow more UV penetration. But this is also why lighter skinned people burn more easily is because they don't have the melanin to protect their skin from that UV radiation. Okay, so what are the recommended intakes of vitamin D? Um, this is also written as international units. So it's suggested to have 600 international units per day, and that would be year round. So a lot of times, um, again, in these northern latitudes, by like, you know, November, December, people are pretty vitamin D deficient because they have not had enough sunlight exposure for a few months. That's why you'll often see that vitamin D supplementation in the winter months is much higher than this. It's usually like 1,000 or 2,000 or sometimes even 5,000 international units a day um, when vitamin D deficiency is so severe uh, in winter months. But that, sh that amount of vitamin D supplementation should only go on for a few months um, during the winter. And then it should be ceased and um, you should expose your skin to the sunlight again to make vitamin D in your skin. Um, there is an upper limit suggested with vitamin D, which is 4,000 international units. Um, again, that would be like, you know, particularly in like June, if you're supplementing with vitamin D still, um, you would put yourself at pretty good risk for toxicity. Um, we haven't talked about ergocalciferol, but this is a form of vitamin D2 that, that may exist in plants um, or does exist in plants, so it may, you may ingest it, but it is, uh, we don't convert it to D3 very well, so it's um, not, not really recommended to take vitamin D2 as a supplement. Most manufacturers are making vitamin D3, so making the supplement with colocalciferol, which is what we make in the skin. So best if you're going to supplement, supplement with um, colocalciferol or D3. And again, the supplement needs to stay right on it, whether it's using D2 or D3. So pick D3 if you can. Um, okay, so ergo, so sources of vitamin D. So ergocalciferol again may be in plants, but our conversion to the active form is not very strong. Um, so colocalciferol is what we make in this in our skin um, and it's also the form most commonly found in supplements anyway. And then there are some foods that might contain some amount of colocalciferol. Uh, I think interestingly like some of our seafood, so seafood not lake food, um, so cod and other fatty fish that live in cold salty water so salmon, mackerel, sardines, they may contain some amount of colocalciferol. Um, and then again, many foods are fortified with colocalciferol. So again, you can look on the ingredients list and you can look on the Nutrition Facts panel to see if the food does contain colocalciferol. Or I should say, to see if the food was fortified with colocalciferol. Um, yeah, so again, not really widely abundant in foods. Um, you could also, during the winter months, focus on your intake of um, salt water, cold water fish to provide some vitamin D3. Again, not much, you know, three ounces is gonna get you pretty darn close to that RDA. Um, so good to, good to consume in the winter for sure. Otherwise, vitamin D we make in our skin. Okay, so what happens if we have too much vitamin D? So the, the biggest issue is would be hypercalcemia, right? Too much blood calcium. Because remember, one of vitamin D's jobs is to take calcium from the bones and put it in the blood. Vitamin D's job is also to increase intestinal absorption of calcium and to increase kidney reabsorption of calcium. So that's the biggest issue is having hypercalcemia. And then you can go back to the calcium page and remind yourself what are some of the issues associated with hypercalcemia. And then what if you don't consume enough? So this is maybe more common than too much vitamin D. 
Um, so rickets is a pretty common vitamin D deficiency seen in children usually with high melanin in their skin. So meaning darker skinned, having darker skin. And so again, part of that is not getting enough vitamin, uh, not making enough vitamin D because of that skin pigmentation uh, because of that melanin and, and usually because of not enough vitamin D, uh, sorry, not enough sunlight exposure. Um, so rickets can form. We can also see osteomalacia, um, which is basically poor bone formation. And again, that's going to be due to loss of bone mass um, because you haven't had enough vitamin D to support bone synthesis. Um, um, low vitamin D status can also result from fat malabsorption issues because remember vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So we need, we need to have, um, yeah, if you're, if you're going to be ingesting vitamin D or taking a vitamin D supplement, if you have any sort of gut issues going on and you're not absorbing fats well, then you're not going to absorb vitamin D well. Um, and then there are also some medications that alter vitamin D metabolism, um, which could result in poor vitamin D status. So anyone taking glucocorticoids or phenobarbital, uh, phenobarbital um, are at risk for vitamin D deficiency. So here's rickets, sort of the telltale feature is sort of the bowed knees, where the bones have not formed well due to low vitamin D status. Uh, so um, yeah, so they sort of form in this bowed way. All right, and then we'll talk about vitamin K. So vitamin K, again, one of our fat soluble, the, now we've talked about them all, vitamin D, E, A, and K, right? So it's fat soluble, meaning we need fat, we need healthy guts that absorb fats well, um, and we store vitamin K in the liver. Um, there are two forms of vitamin K, um, K1 and K2. K1 is also called phyloquinone, and this is a form we find in plants. And then there's menaquinone, which is vitamin K2, and we find this in animals, um, actually including ourselves, because this is a form that's produced by bacteria in the gut. Um, so that's why we find it in animals, is because we find it um, produced by the bacteria that live in animal guts. Um, we know that phyloquinone, um, we know a little bit more about phyloquinone, like transportation, um, and that we can store it, again, primarily in the liver, but small amounts also in adipose and bone. And then um, functions of vitamin K, so why we talk about it here in the bone lecture, is because vitamin K can function as a coenzyme. So remember, most coenzymes are vitamins, they're larger compounds. Um, and vitamin K um, acts as a coenzyme in the production of proteins that support blood coagulation and bone metabolism. Um, so we'll talk about blood coagulation when we talk about blood, but here we can talk about um, vitamin K in its support of building um, bone metabolism proteins. And then here are just your two representations of the two forms of vitamin K, phyloquinone K1 and menaquinone K2. And again, you can see it's basically a fat molecule, right? It kind of has that sterile backbone and the like fatty tail. Same with um, vitamin D, I'll go back because I didn't point that out. I think it's relatively important. So you can kind of see almost like a sterile back, almost like two sterile backbones, right? And then that fatty chain. All right, back to vitamin K. Um, so let's talk about these two um, proteins that, that vitamin K, whose synthesis vitamin K supports. So vitamin K supports the production of these two proteins that we call GLA proteins. And so one of those proteins is called osteocalcin and the other is called matrix GLA protein. So osteocalcin is a protein secreted by the osteoblasts 
And remember, osteoblasts support bone remodeling, and particularly that bone formation portion of remodeling. And then matrix GLA protein is a protein found in the bone matrix, also found in cartilage, blood vessel walls, and soft tissues. Um, and what we know so far about matrix GLA protein is that it may actually help prevent the calcification of arteries, which would thereby reduce the risk for developing cardiovascular disease. Um, I guess I wrote it twice. It's that important. So that's kind of what that's what we'll say about vitamin K really in this lecture is just that it basically supports bone formation and can reduce um, that calcification in the arteries, in part because it might be supporting calcium deposition in the bones. So vitamin K, um, I guess I would almost say it's like a newer vitamin that we're learning more about. So there is no RDA or upper limit established for vitamin K. Um, so what we have is the adequate intake. So adequate intake is suggested at 120 micrograms per day, which again is rel relatively low. Um, for males and 90 micrograms per day for females. That's almost like on the order that we talk about with the trace minerals. Instead of talking about milligrams, we, it's a really small amount, so it's just 120 micrograms. Um, again, vitamin K is synthesized by bacteria that live in our large intestines, so we do need to have a healthy gut in order to make enough vitamin K or in order for those bacteria to make enough vitamin K. And that would be K2. And then we do also get some K1 from um, dark green leafy vegetables, basically. So pretty easy to get adequate vitamin K. The, A, the adequate intake is just that 90 to 120 micrograms. So like any amount of greens <laughs> should give you your vitamin K for the day. So what happens if we consume too much? As far as we know, so far, there are no side effects associated with too much vitamin K intake. Um, also, vitamin K deficiency is pretty rare, um, but the biggest issue would be reduced clotting. So we mentioned that vitamin K supports the synthesis of blood clotting proteins, which we'll talk about more in chapter 12, um, but that could lead to, of course, excessive bleeding, which could be dangerous. And then the causes of vitamin K deficiency are also um, pretty important because they're I'd say, becoming increasingly common. So again, any sort of fat malabsorption disorders, which could be celiac disease, Crohn's disease, cystic fibrosis, also long-term use of antibiotics could kill off some of those bacteria, all of those bacteria that make vitamin K2. Um, and then this isn't so much a deficiency, but just sort of an FYI. Most newborns, uh, all newborns are given an injection of vitamin K at birth uh, because their microbiome hasn't formed yet. So they don't have the bacterial colonies that would produce vitamin K. And again, we can store some vitamin K because it's fat soluble. Um, so typically that injection will you know, be enough for that newborn until it starts to develop its microbiome. Alrighty, and then we'll talk about phosphorus here. Um, so phosphorus, uh, we also talked about in the electrolytes lecture. Phosphorus is our major intracellular, so inside the cell, negatively charged ion or electrolyte, so cation. So it's our major intracellular cation with potassium, our major intracellular anion, positively charged. Um, phosphorus is an important component of all cells. Remember, anywhere where we have phospholipids are going to contain phosphorus. So that um, phospholipid bilayer contains phosphorus, and that's for both plants and animals. Um, and then other functions would be, again, bone formation, of course, fluid balance, its role as an electrolyte. And then again, anywhere where we find phosphorus, so adenosine triphosphate, also a component of our DNA, and then also a component, you know, a component of those phospholipid bilayers, which are the cell membranes. RDA for phosphorus is about 700 mg for adults. Um, most foods are pretty um, abundant in phosphorus, so again, deficiency is relatively rare. Um, many processed foods contain 
um, phosphorus as, a, as an additive. And also soft drinks contain phosphoric acid. Um, so there's more risk of too much phosphorus intake than there is risk for um, poor phosphorus intake. Um, we've seen actually that high phosphorus intake is associated with premature mortality, even in healthy adults. So again, deficiencies are relatively rare. The primary places where we see phosphorus deficiency are alcohol abuse, um, prematurely born infants, and elderly um, people who have really, really poor diets. Um, as I said, the issue is more with too much phosphorus intake. So excessive phosphorus intake um, um, yep, can lead to really, the two major issues are really just muscle spasms and convulsions. Um, but the way we're gonna have the causes of excess phosphorus would be vitamin D supplementation, or excess dietary phosphorus. So whether that's from processed foods or too much soda, um, or could also be from um, antacids that, that have phosphorus in them. Alrighty, and then the last nutrient that we'll talk about for bone health is magnesium. Um, this is probably my favorite micronutrient, um, but a really important one nonetheless. So um, blood magnesium levels are also highly regulated by the body. Um, as we have seen, absorption will decrease with higher intakes um, and also absorption is impaired by excessive alcohol intake. We do store magnesium in our bones and we can also store some in our soft tissue. The functions of magnesium are almost endless. Um, magnesium supports over 300 different enzyme systems throughout the body by acting as a cofactor. Again, minerals are cofactors. Um, so for example, magnesium supports ATP synthesis, DNA synthesis, and protein synthesis. Magnesium, magnesium also improves the sensitivity, um, the cell sensitivity to insulin. Magnesium supports vitamin D metabolism as well as the action of vitamin D. Um, and magnesium supports muscle contraction and relaxation and blood clotting. Um, and then in the bone, so again, magnesium is found in the bone. It supports that hydroxyapatite crystalline structure. And again, it works with vitamin D and parathyroid hormone to help um, regulate blood calcium levels. Recommended intake for magnesium varies based on age and sex. Um, and we've got, I do have a chart coming up to actually talk about the different RDAs for magnesium. And then the upper limit for magnesium is recommended at about um, 300 mg per day. Um, but you'll we'll see that some of, depending on the um, yeah depending on the age, magnesium like the actual RDA for magnesium will exceed 350 mg per day. So um, this is sort of, um, sometimes we override the magnesium upper limit. Uh, so food sources of magnesium would be our dark green leafy vegetables, our whole grains, nuts and seeds, um, beans and legumes, and then seafood and dairy products could also be some good sources. Um, dietary protein enhances our absorption and retention of magnesium, so it's important to get enough protein. And then, of course, refined and processed foods are going to be very low in magnesium. So this is this makes me laugh every time I see it. So trail mix is is what's suggested, containing a lot of nuts and seeds. So like one cup would actually get you relatively close um, to this AI. Uh, and you'll see the AI for males is up here at 400 megs per day. Um, spinach is also going to come in at like, you know, 150 or so megs per, per cup um, cooked. Pumpkin seeds, uh, beans, rice. Yep. So magnesium is a really important one to get from your plant foods. It's maybe the, of all of the micronutrients, it's probably the one that's most critical to get from your plant foods. 
Um, and what happens if we have too much magnesium? So again, we there's it's not really heard of to have too much dietary magnesium. We typically only see hypermagnesemia, hypermagnesemia from excess supplementation. And even the um, symptoms of excess magnesium supplementation aren't that terrible. Um, I mean, they can be if they go on for too long, uh, but you could see some diarrhea, some nausea and some cramps, potentially dehydration and acid base imbalances. Um, and then you might also see hypermagnesemia uh, in people who have impaired kidney function um, and people who might be taking an antacids, which can also be a source of magnesium. And if we don't consume enough magnesium, so this is also, this is actually really common, is for people to have really low blood magnesium levels, so hypomagnesemia. Um, what we see are muscle cramps and spasms or, or seizures. Um, yeah, one of the most common things I see are muscle cramps in people who have too low body magnesium. You can also see nausea, weakness, irritability, and confusion. Um, long term, you could see osteoporosis uh, due to poor calcium status. Um, and we see that hypomagnesemia is associated with a lot of chronic diseases. So heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes. Um, so arguably, magnesium would, getting adequate magnesium would be a part of the prevention of these chronic diseases. Um, so of course, hypomagnesemia is likely to result from poor dietary intake, but it can also result from chronic diarrhea because you could be losing magnesium in the feces. Um, of course, can really result from kidney disease, not reabsorbing enough magnesium from the um, urine filtrate, and also alcohol abuse could cause hypomagnesemia. Oh, sorry, I might have said magnesium was the last one, but fluoride is actually the, the last micronutrient that we'll talk about related to bones. Um, so fluoride is a trace mineral, meaning we need it in relatively small amounts. We store fluoride in our teeth and our bones. Um, again, fluoride with calcium and magnesium form that um, hydroxyapatite structure. And then in teeth, um, they form something called fluorohydroxyapatite. Um, so functions, again, are to be part of that structure of teeth and bones. Um, they can actually, again, this fluorohydroxyapatite uh, fluorohydroxyapatite structure actually protects the teeth from bacteria, so it protects the teeth from bacterial decay, um, and then um, fluoride also supports bone growth. Um, recommended intake for fluoride, the adequate intake again varies by sex and by age, um, but it ranges from about one to four megs per day. Um, most people in the United States are getting fluoride from fluoridated water. So most municipal waters contain a fluoride treatment. Um, you can also get those um, like dental fluoride treatments um, to absorb fluoride that way. So what happens if we have too much fluoride? Um, the biggest issue is fluorosis, which is um, basically where you're teeth have too much fluoride in them um, and it makes the teeth porous actually. So the teeth kind of become pitted and they might even look stained. And then if you don't consume enough fluoride, a person would be at greater risk for dental caries or cavities um, because of that lack of that fluorohydroxyapatite which protects the teeth from harmful bacteria. So here's a look at fluorosis and you can pretty much, pretty obvious, right? That pitting of the teeth, so kind of that, that porousness of the teeth. So making them much easier to break. And that's from too much fluoride. Um, and this is the chart I was referring to that would show you the recommended magnesium intakes. Obviously this is a helpful overview for the RDA for all of these um, bone related nutrients. And I like that your book calls um, Oh, your book has this section 7.5, 7 which you will have a 
um, Pearson quiz on, but this is kind of a fun little overview and I like the title. <laughs> it calls it um, Vitamins and Minerals, Micronutrients with Macro Powers. So I definitely recommend um, reviewing that and reading that also, especially before the Unit 3 exam. That would be a helpful review of all of these chapters on micronutrients. Um, so yeah, we've talked about all of these. We just haven't actually highlighted the um, magnesium RDA. So for females over 30, it's suggested to have 320 mg per day. Um, for males, as they age, the, the suggestion, the recommendation actually goes up a bit. Um, and then I would also say anyone who is very physically active should also increase their magnesium intake because they're going to see a higher magnesium turnover due to that excessive sweating and excessive metabolic activity. Okay, so it looks like at this point I'm just going to make chapter 11 one lecture. So for, forgive me um, for what I said in the beginning. Um, I guess I managed to power on through here. So now we can start to wrap up this chapter and just talk about some of the diseases and disorders associated with um, poor bone health. Um, yeah, so osteoporosis is the primary issue, right? Osteo meaning bone and porous meaning porous, having, having holes. So osteoporosis is the most prevalent bone health disorder. It is basically a disorder characterized by low bone mass um, and then also a deterioration of bone tissue. So it means that bones become fragile and weak, leading to increased risk for bone fracture. Um, there's also risk for what's called bone compaction, which is where um, like the, the porousness of those bones basically allows the bone to like collapse a little bit and become like more compact. So especially if you see that in the vertebra, um, you would see decreased height. And then um, another way that osteoporosis can manifest is in like a shortening and a hunching of the spine, which we call specifically kyphosis. Um, and sometimes that's, that hump in the spine is referred to as the dowager's hump. So here is an example of kyphosis. So Part of this could potentially be related to poor posture over time, but then also related to um, inadequate uh, um, nutrient status to support healthy bones, thereby resulting in osteoporosis. So osteoporosis, there are two types. Um, I mean, very similar, but type one is more common in females who are postmenopause. And so type one osteoporosis is really associated with low estrogen that occurs in menopause. And so we see risks, uh, we see the wrists and um, the vertebrae are at greater risk for fracture in type one osteoporosis, which is sometimes called postmenopausal osteoporosis. And then type two, which is sometimes called senile osteoporosis is more common in older folks. So over age 70. And we see here, um, it's the trabecular and the cortical bone that are at risk for osteoporosis. So we'll see some of those, um, we'll see like the hip bone um, and, and the spine are the two places in the body that are more at risk for fracturing. Both types of osteoporosis are more common in females. And we'll talk a little bit about um, why that is in these next few slides. So here's just a cool like x-ray image showing healthy hip bone on the left and an osteoporotic hip bone on the right. Uh, and so you can just see like the head of the femur and then you can see the hip bone. You, you can, and even the spine back here, you can really basically make out how porous it is relative to the healthy bone on the left. It just looks pretty smooth and solid. Um, like and very very sort of obvious to um, see sort of the sacrum and the coccyx and the hip bones and the femur heads, whereas over here on the right it's a little bit more blurred together. Right? Also, a nice um, close-up look at um, how this time it's flipped. So uh, this is looking at a vertebra. So on the right this time is the healthy vertebra, and on the left is the osteoporotic vertebra. And again, really, you can just see that 
the porosis, the holes um, in that trabecular bone. And so that's where compaction is possible, like where this pore is, you know, the bone up top could basically collapse down um, on this lower part of the bone and, and therefore compact the bone a bit. So risk factors for osteoporosis, um, some things that are, that are out of our control would be age, sex, and genetics. But then as always, we have lifestyle factors too, right? These are what we would call modifiable risk factors. So use of tobacco, alcohol, and caffeine, your nutrient intake, and your physical activity or inactivity. Um, and basically, again, the risk factors would be being not being active enough, so physical inactivity, having a poor or an unhealthy diet, but to a greater risk for osteoporosis, and then use of tobacco, especially excessive use of tobacco, alcohol, and caffeine, puts a person at greater risk for osteoporosis. Um, again, genetics, so just having a family background of osteoporosis, um, females are at a greater risk for osteoporosis, and as we age, we're at a greater risk for osteoporosis. So bone mineral density, that's what BMD stands for, declines with age. Uh, so this is really interesting. If you look up here in the right, um, we've got two lines here, right? You have line A, and then you have line B, which is, so line A comes out of menopause. Line B is also another option coming out of menopause. So these are showing two different lifestyles and how bone mineral density changes based on lifestyle after menopause. So of course, bone density is declining no matter what after menopause, but somebody who follows a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle, as I alluded to before, is going to see a decrease, a slower rate of decline in peak bone density. Uh, a slower rate of decline of bone density, I should say. Whereas somebody who leads an unhealthy lifestyle and Potentially, as we said, some medications can also lead to um, bone density loss. You're going to see this like exponential increase in the rate of bone, bone mineral density decline. So um, somebody who's leading an unhealthy lifestyle is likely to reach that fracture zone um, at a much earlier time, whereas somebody who leads a healthy lifestyle might reach their 80s and still be pretty far away from that fracture zone. Um, so again, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. The non-modifiable, of course, age, um, genetics, so your race. Again, this would be, um, again, somebody with a higher um, melanin in their skin is gonna actually be at a higher risk for osteoporosis, especially if living in northern or southern latitudes. Um, again, genetics, family history, females are at a greater risk. Um, and that's actually in large part due to um, that menstruation uh, throughout their adult years and then menopause in midlife. Modifiable risk factors, so things that we can control. Smoking, body weight, so all of these are written, and again, these are all risk factors, so they're written in a way that increases the risk for osteoporosis. So use of tobacco, having a low body weight, having low calcium intake, having low sun exposure, <clears throat> alcohol abuse, a history of amenorrhea, which is a failure to actually menstruate, um, especially with or nutrient intake, um, estrogen deficiency, testosterone deficiency, repeated falls, and physical inactivity. These all increase the risk for osteoporosis, but these are all also modifiable. These are all lifestyle-based. So we'll talk a little bit about some of these modifiable risk factors. So age, uh, well, sorry, this is not modifiable. And so bone, bone mass, bone density decreases with age, um, and again, that's largely related to the hormonal changes that happen as we age. So as we decrease our production of estrogen and testosterone as we age, that causes a decrease in bone density. Um, again, we also see decreased vitamin D status as we age. That's also going to lead to decreased ability to deposit new calcium in the bones. 
Um, sex, so again, um, much more common in females. 80% of people in the United States with osteoporosis are females. Um, and that's largely just because females start out with lower bone density than males, typically. Um, also related to the um, estrogen changes um, that happen throughout the adult years and then also menopause. Also, females are at a greater risk for osteoporosis because of societal pressures. So females are more likely to put their bodies through extreme dieting and more likely than males to feel pressured to keep a really low body weight. But that's going to lead to lower body weight, which is going to lead to less weight-bearing stress on the bones. And it is specifically weight-bearing stress on the bones in conjunction with a healthy diet that supports bone formation. So if the body isn't heavy enough to actually stress the bones enough, then the body won't build new healthy bone. Um, and then weight loss and poor diet also, or, or extreme dieting, like not taking in enough calories, is also going to cause low estrogen production, which is in turn going to cause low bone mineral density. Um, genetics, so again, a family history of osteoporosis will increase the risk. Um, so non-Hispanic white women of low body weight with first degree relative who've had osteoporosis are at a greater risk. Um, yep. And the same thing. So postmenopausal estrogen levels and bone resorption rates. Uh, bone resorption rates are going to increase as we age. And that post those that decrease in the postmenopausal estrogen levels are also going to increase the bone resorption. Okay, so some of the modifiable risk factors. So tobacco, alcohol, and caffeine. Um, so we know that cigarette smoking affects some of the hormones that, that regulate bone formation and bone resorption. Um, alcoholism is also associated with higher rates of fractures. Um, and caffeine can actually increase um, calcium excretion in the urine. So again, all of these leading to decreased bone mineral density. Nutrition, again, being a modifiable risk factor. So as we talked about, many of our fruits and vegetables are really important food sources of nutrients that support bone health. Um, so we didn't revisit vitamin C, but you might remember vitamin C is really important for collagen formation. And in the bone, we have those hydroxyapatite crystals that form around collagen. Um, and then we also have collagen in that connective tissue in the cartilage and the connective tissue that supports bones. Um, vitamin K and magnesium, also our best food sources for these are plants. Um, again, vitamin K, it's also important to keep a healthy gut to support the bacteria that will make vitamin K. And supporting a healthy gut involves a, a high intake of plant food. Um, high protein intake can also increase calcium loss, and that's actually potentially due to that um, acid-base balance of the blood. Um, again, poor calcium intake and poor vitamin D synthesis can result in low bone density. Um, and then also potentially too much sodium might affect bone density, um, but it's kind of like a, a newer thought. So the biggest issues with nutrition and osteoporosis are just not getting enough of these nutrients we've talked about, especially calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K, and magnesium. And then physical inactivity. So nutrition is super important, but so is physical activity. So um, exercise is really protective against bone loss and therefore protective against osteoporosis. Again, it's specifically weight-bearing activities. So anything where your body, your bones have to bear the weight of your body. So for example, like swimming is a good example of a non-weight-bearing activity because your body is supported by the water. But, but And then I think weight training, like doing weight resistant activities is perhaps maybe the most obvious example of a weight bearing activity. Um, but walking and jogging, so again, anything where your bones have to support the weight of your body against gravity are going to support um, 
well, <laughs> your bones are going to be stressed by bearing your body weight or whatever extra weight you might carry with, if you're going to use weight training exercises. And that stress on the bones increases this bone remodeling, which means we increase the breakdown of old bone cells and we increase the formation of new healthy bone cells. So weight-bearing activities are critical for healthy bone formation. Um, yeah, so exercise positively stresses bone tissues and stimulates bone, like um, bone mineral deposition, thereby increasing bone mineral density. But it has to be specifically weight-bearing act activities. Um, and then we'll talk a little more about um, relative energy deficiency in sports which is some is abbreviated REDS. Um, we'll talk about this more when we talk about um, physical activity in, chapter, in unit four, um, but this is basically having relative energy deficiency, so not taking in enough calories, particularly in sports. So what this means is somebody who's in sports, and we, we commonly see this in, you know, um, adolescents and teenage people. They might be playing sports for their middle school or their high school, but maybe not eating enough um, and not eating well to support all of the exercise that they're putting their bodies through. So what that might mean is they might not be getting enough protein to, um, to well build their muscles, but also support like magnesium absorption. They might not be eating enough magnesium. They might not be eating enough calcium. They might not be eating enough vitamin K, and they might not be um, getting enough sunlight exposure. So all of that is going to negatively impact their bone health. But then that's all coupled with being in sports, so stressing their bones out. So you're going to see that you're going to see bone resorption, you're going to see bone breakdown. But if the body, if they haven't replenished their bodies with healthy foods and enough food, they're not going to see enough bone formation, the second part of bone remodeling, to actually build back healthy bones. So um, relative energy deficiency in sports is also a risk, a modifiable risk factor for osteoporosis. Um, and that segues pretty strongly into the female athlete triad. Um, female, so the female athlete triad. So it's a, a female athlete. So female meaning they're going, the person's going to be going through monthly menstruation, which is a pretty significant loss of blood. Um, also going to, also an athlete. So again, putting all this stress on their bodies. And then the third part is typically not eating well. So typically reds. Um, and again, that is further going to um, put a person at risk for low bone density. So it's not to say that all, that a female athlete necessarily has osteoporosis. It's saying that a female athlete is at a greater risk for osteoporosis relative to a male athlete. And then how do we treat osteoporosis? So there isn't really a cure, unfortunately, because it's typically diagnosed um, as we age. So again, we can't replace bone density at that point. So the best um, way to address osteoporosis is actually to prevent it, right? Um, so prevent it, or if it's, been, if it's been diagnosed, then the best thing you can do is to slow the progression. So for both prevention and slowing the progression, it's again, healthy lifestyle. So potentially get off any medications that might be affecting bone density, and then eat a healthy diet rich in calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, um, vitamin K. Make sure you're getting enough but not too much phosphorus. Make sure you're getting enough but not too much fluoride. Engage in weight-bearing exercises every day, you know, maybe five days a week if you can. Engage in weight training exercises or resistance training exercises two to three times a week. All right, well, that's it for chapter 11. So again, I apologize in the beginning, I said it would be two lectures, but it's actually just gonna be this one. So as always, you can thumb through these questions and test your understanding of the material. As always, email me if you have any questions. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time for chapter 12.